By the early 20th century, there were gangs across the country that were associated with race course rackets. These gangs are not like mafia gangs, which are really well organised, that have got dons, captains, consiglieri, advisors, lieutenants and soldiers. They tended to operate in sixes and sevens, and they would go to race courses as pickpockets. And they would target somebody that's won a few bob. And they would really hunt that person down. They used the term, we stabbed the victim. And that's literally what happened. If they couldn't get an easy dip into the pocket, they would become brutal. They would literally beat the person up. In the years leading up to the First World War, this amorphous gathering of gangs, collectively known as the Brummagem Boys, became a much firmer alliance. And the reason being, it was led by a feared fighter, a man with a magnetic personality, a bloke who had a mind of superior intelligence and who could make alliances. His name was Billy Kimber. It was a Brummie who'd come out of Summer Lane. His dad was a Summer Laner. His mum come out of Mary Ann Street just across the way from Summer Lane on the edge of the Jewelry Quarter. His dad had lived all his life and would live all his life in and around the lane. Sam Dell was a respected bookmaker from London and he knew Billy Kimber well and he, he, he described him to me and he said he was well liked by us all but you didn't cross him. In a court case in 1923, the main rival to Billy Kimber, Darby Sabini, he stated that you could make up to £5,000 a year just from printing the race cards. One of his enforcers was called Georgie Langham. I interviewed his son and he told me his dad used to come home from the races with so many bags filled with half a crown, they had to pour them in the bath. They used to then just share out all this mass of silver. The Birmingham gang would turn up at all of the meetings with this great big wagon in the back of which were all of these collapsible stalls and they'd put them up and you'd have to pay 10 bob, 50 pence, a lot of money. Even after the First World War, when an unskilled labourer would be lucky to earn two pound, two pound fifty a week and a skilled man, four, four and a half quid a week. Then the bookmakers used to have big blackboards upon which they'd write the prices. Well, you need chalk, don't you? Two and a tanner for each piece of chalk for each race. There might be six to eight races at a meeting. So each race you're paying two and sixpence, twelve and a half pence. That's 15 bob with the six races. That's a lot of money. But then after each race, you've got to get rid of the chalk, haven't you? Because you've got to put up the prices for the next horse race. So what happens? The gangs come along with a bucket of water and a sponge. So you're paying another half a dollar, two and sixpence. In rhyming slang, a dollar's five bob. And an Oxford scholar is five bob. Half a dollar is two and sixpence. So you've got to pay another half a dollar. It's mounting up, isn't it? These aren't men that you would like to drink with, to socialise with. They are men for whom violence, sadly, was a way of life on all sides. And it is not romantic to read these accounts. It actually churns the stomach to see what other men could do to other men who were their opponents. The flying squad was brought in to stamp out ruffianism. On top of that, the jockey club started to employ proper stewards and the bookmakers fed up to the back teeth of protectionism and gang warfare had started their proper bookmakers protection associations and said no more Will we have protectionism? No more will the gang leader say, I've got the best pitch, you've got to give me 50 pence in the pound from everything that you win. Then about 1927, Billy Kimber, he ends up, so we believe, in Arizona, where he's supposed to have killed a man for owning money. Think about it. His daughter, Maudie, his oldest daughter said, you owe our dad, dad money, you paid with your life. He then turns up in Chicago, and teams up with someone from Birmingham called Humphreys, who is involved with Al Capone's mob. Then he comes back to England. He settled down in Torquay and became a respected and legitimate bookmaker. And interestingly, a leading figure in the regional BPA, the Bookmakers Protection Association, the very body which had really sounded the death knell to his racecourse rackets. He died in 1945, a very rich man, Far from the back streets of Summer Lane, he was living in wealth in the south of England and left his family three and a half thousand pounds. 
That was a very big amount of money.